It's testament to how bad things have become when 12 missiles hit a Ukrainian city and the overwhelming sense is relief that it wasn't more. At least one person died in the southern city of Zaporizhia this morning. The strikes across the country today were not on the same scale as yesterday's countrywide attacks, which saw over 11 cities hit and 84 missiles used. The Ukrainians said 28 cruise missiles were launched at the country today, with many intercepted, about a third the size of yesterday's barrage. The world is still trying to make sense of yesterday's onslaught, mostly on civilian infrastructure. A virtual meeting of G7 leaders heard from President Zelensky this afternoon. I thank all of you for the help already provided. It's of great significance. But the Russian leader, who is now in the final stage of his reign, still has room for further escalation. This possibility is a threat to all of us, but we can overcome it. He went on to appeal for financial assistance to create an advanced air shield defence system off the back of yesterday's attacks. In London, the head of GCHQ said there were no current signs of Russia moving nuclear assets, an assessment echoed by US officials recently. In a speech this afternoon, the intelligence chief said that yesterday's attack pointed to weakness in Russia, running out of morale, men and missiles. The gains are being reversed. The, the costs to Russia in people and equipment are staggering. And we know, and Russian military commanders know, that their supplies and munition are running out. Analysis by Forbes magazine estimated that yesterday's cruise missile and drone strikes cost Russia between 400 and 700 million dollars. It's difficult getting an accurate take on what's left in their stockpile, but there are indicators. I think over the last few months, we've noticed a decreased use of Russian cruise missiles and uh, precision guided munitions in general. This can potentially indicate two things. On the one hand, it can mean that Russia have problems with acquiring targets for such miss missiles, but the other explanation could be that uh, the stockpile of PGMs is relatively low. It's reported that Russia has started buying military drones from Iran and rockets from North Korea, signs perhaps that sanctions are hampering access to component parts and supply lines. Video released yesterday purports to show a Ukrainian soldier taking out a Russian missile. Ukraine's defense ministry said its forces had shot down 300 Russian cruise missiles since February. It's impossible to confirm that tally, but thousands of Russian missiles have been used during this war. So that's the missiles and where they come from, finally to where they land. Oksana Leonteva was a doctor. She just dropped off her five-year-old son at nursery yesterday, was driving to work at the hospital in Kyiv, but never made it. Well, earlier I spoke to Dmitry Polyansky, Russia's deputy ambassador to the UN, and I asked him whether Russia is indeed running out of ammunition. I think that all those who were asking this question and who were implying in March that we are running out of ammunition now feel a little bit uh, ashamed uh, because uh, the latest uh, response that we had to this terrorist attack to the Crimea breach, I think, shows that we are well in shape, well informed. We're just very much uh, measuring our response uh, and uh, people do not appreciate it, right. uh, unfortunately. So you had to bomb civilian targets in a number of Ukrainian cities to prove to the world that you've still got rockets? What kind of civilian uh, targets did we bomb Playgrounds, in Ukrainian cities? parks in the city, you know, a busy junction in Russia, in the middle of the business district uh, of you should, Kiev. These are not military uh, you should targets. All, you should always uh, be mindful of, uh, of Ukrainian stray missiles from air defense, which usually cause this kind of damage. As far as, far as our uh, strikes are concerned, I'm not an expert, of course, but I heard that there were about 100 missiles, I may be mistaken, uh, and there were about 20 people reported uh, dead uh, after these missiles. Of course, each victim is uh, far too many, 
but uh, some of the objects that were targeted were like uh, headquarters of uh, intelligence of Ukrainian inte Apartment intelligence. Apartment blocks that is in planning. Zaporizhia, you know, civilian dwellings across the country. I mean, these are not military targets. I heard. These are war crimes. I aren't saw they? clear. I saw a clear report about this apartment block that it was uh, actually the target of uh, Ukrainian stray missile because otherwise it would be demolished completely. Let me stand back a little bit and ask you another question. We're now seven and a half months into this war. Uh, Finland and Sweden have joined NATO. Ukraine has applied for NATO. You've lost a lot of the territory that you gained at the beginning in the northeast of the country. You're, you know, you're under a counteroffensive in the south that you don't seem to be doing well at. You've lost your battleship Moskva. You've lost part of the bridge. You're economically isolated. You've become a pariah state around the world. Was it really, really worth it? Was this really worth it? Where do you take this information that we become a pariah state? Uh, I don't know. I work in the UN. I don't feel that we are isolated. I feel that rather Western countries are isolated because they are trying to to twist the hands of everybody and trying to push everybody into their anti-Russian yeah. narrative. And uh, the countries are sick and tired of this. So where do you take all this information? Well, you, want, right you wanted a secret vote on the annexation, the illegal annexation of the four regions in the Donbass. Um, you wanted a secret vote at the General Assembly, and that's not been granted yes, to you. You're getting a public vote. You're, not, you're clearly not getting your way in the United Nations as much as you thought you would. We wanted to avoid the situation which we are facing right now, when Western countries are twisting their hands and pushing everybody, everybody uh, blackmailing everybody, uh, trying to gain their votes, which is very, uh, very uh, deplorable for the UN. Mm. So we wanted to give everybody the opportunity to vote and to take their vote without any external pressure, including our pressure, theoretical. And the Western countries were just afraid that without a gun to the heads of, uh, of uh, independent countries, they would yeah. not vote in the way that they want them to vote. That's, it's very simple. You're so right, your, that's, your picture you're is right that some wrong. of the countries in the UN have been sitting on the fence on this, and some countries also support you, a small number. But if the, is the danger not here for Russia that as you escalate this war, as you use loose talk on nukes, as your president has done twice in the last few weeks, you're going to alienate people like China who have so far been on your side? This is your wishful thinking and speculations. I see what reality is, and I work at the UN. I feel the mood of the people. It's absolutely the opposite. And by the way, you're always calling it a war, but it's still a special military operation. Well, your I, own I, people I, are calling it a war back in Russia, frankly. I mean, you know, all these commentators there are, there are on Russian people, television, there are many you know, people the cats out of the bag, they're all calling it a war. With different opinion, I'm absolutely sure that there are people in Great Britain that call it special military operation. Listen, I think we've, that argument, okay. I think, has probably been settled. Dmitry Polyansky, thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you.